Coming up on Mount Hermeneutics, consciousness. Is it in us or is it us? We'll get into it, so keep it right here. You're listening to Mount Hermeneutics, where three Marines give their perspective on God, faith, and spirituality with a heavy lean on the Divine Council worldview. This is not your grandma's Sunday school, nor is it always for the Christian vein of heart. Nothing about who we are or what we say make us experts. But you better believe we'll have a take, and perhaps it won't suck. It's just a number. I mean, my doctor says I'm basically like 25, so. Is, is that, is that what you're saying? That's your is psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've like, never talked for 20 minutes straight. Uh, he's got somebody uh, uh, emailed in. Yeah. Give us a topic. Your topic could be next. <laughs> you see how we can butcher all your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms, including YouTube, simply by searching Mount Hermeneutics. So please subscribe wherever you're watching right now and share the show with every single person you've ever run into ever in your life share it with them and uh if you're new to the show i am andre and these two gentlemen are matt and brian tell us what's up man hey hey andre hi matt how do how do yeah you know it's it's kind of a weird week but yeah i, I don't I, i'm just working nothing nothing significant mm-hmm. going on just in the in the grind just part of the grind we we had our second false fall where <laughs> this has been like the the most lingering summer we've had to date. I, I'm assuming it has to do with the hurricane and whatnot that's going on out east, but uh, it's just been so hot and not hot, like hundred degrees, but it's been in the solid nineties. And then we had like a three day where it was like, it dropped down into the seventies and it's like, Oh, sweet fall J- JK back in the nineties. <laughs> um, and that's happened twice now. And I'm, I'm a big fan of fall. Um, one, I have really bad allergies. Um, if, if, it, if the VA is listening, it's rhinitis and sinusitis. I have six to 12 extreme events per year. Um, but like, I hate the pollen. I hate the spring and I hate mosquitoes. So I love the fall and the winter dearly. Um, plus I like to bird hunt and deer hunt. And those things also happen in the winter. So it can't get here soon enough for me. All right. I like winter. Yeah. Anything going on in Tulsa? I uh going on in Tulsa. I see that the Kansas City mob is coming into Tulsa to try to try to get Dwight Manfredi out of there. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm it's, I'm not caught up on that show. Oh, but, spoiler uh, alert. But uh, oh yeah, I haven't started I either. I don't think yeah. I am gonna I don't I don't really like the show. I don't like but, it. I don't even know why we're doing the show anymore then. <laughs> like, I, even... I love I, I I you know that I there's no bigger f- Sylvester Stallone fan in the world than me. Apparently I, not. Apparently I, you're lying. I because I, a real Stallone fan would just watch whatever he does. I tried. I tried it. Have I you just... seen Oscar? I have. And I liked it. Stop mm-hmm. on my mom will shoot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That one. Rhinestone. That one's Stallone. a keeper because Stallone and the National Treasure known as Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton did that one. Yeah. So I mean it, it's okay if you're not he if you're stuff. not as big a Stallone fan as as you claim to be, that's okay. I mean, not everybody is. Well, I I love him despite <laughs> some of those things. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of Tulsa King. I don't I don't think it's a good show. I like I season know. one. I haven't I haven't watched any part of season two. So, um, I've been yeah. watching Heels. I've been watching Heels. I've been watching Vikings, and it's uh, it's my favorite thing in the world. It's and, uh, and for me to rotate between Heels and Mr. And, McMahon and the McMahon show, yeah. Plus, plus, I you know I went on my run of the dark side of the ring. I, I'm just all I'm all wrapped. Speaking of, did you see? Up. Did you see uh, the exchange between me and Weathers today on Facebook? Yes. <laughs> yes, and then I, and then I wrote Sting is 65. <laughs> He's like, that's the wrestler guy. That's not the singer. <laughs> uh, Brian, so uh, one of our one of our buddies in the Marine Corps just made a random post because it was Sting's birthday today. Sting, the the rock star. And right. <clears throat> there is also a famous professional wrestler named Sting. I, I, I and that up. 
the three of us watched a lot of professional wrestling back in the day. And uh, so when, when uh, Weathers made the post, he goes, holy crap, Sting the singer is 73 today. And I commented, I said, I love that you have to differentiate between which Sting. And he said, I did it literally for you and Bibbs. <laughs> because... <laughs> Yeah. So it's just kind of funny because I'm like Sting is definitely not 73. I mean, he's a senior citizen, but he's not, he's not 73. Right. On a completely different note, I I was just surprised to learn this, and I learned it today. And you're the first people I'm sharing it with. Did you know that Doctor Doom doesn't actually have a doctorate? You know the supervillain. I know who you're talking yeah, I, about, Doctor yeah. Von Doom. Doctor Victor Von Doom. Not then why doctor. did they call him Dr. Doom? I think, well, he's the ruler of Latveria, and I think he probably just makes people call him that. Because The ruler of Lat... Where in the hell is Latveria? It's the it's an Eastern European country that he rules. He probably just it's created the... a university there and like made them give him a doctorate. Well, then he has a doctorate. Like I don't know. But why. it's not like a real doctorate. It's just like a... I mean, so he I never mean, wrote I'm, like a dissertation or anything? I don't even know if he did that much, but he's not a medical doctor and he never got a doctorate in anything. He's I studied. assumed he had like a PhD in astrophysics who, or something. Who's, who's saying that he doesn't have a doctorate in anything? Look it up. I mean, I mean that's why you're here. I, you, I you're the to, one that broke I, the news. I wanted to know. like The burden of proof is on you, Brian. I was, I was wondering, what does he have a doctorate in? So oh, right. I looked it up. And the internet has confirmed he doesn't have a doctorate. Now he he was he studied in school with Reed Richards, right. who has multiple PhDs in right. like electrical engineering and physics maybe, and maybe astrophysics. He said, hey, and hook stuff. a brother up with it, with one of your doctorates. But doctor, but Mister Doom, uh, <laughs> Mister <Vic>. Doom <laughs> turned to evil and dropped out of college before he got his doctorate. So he's. Oh. So he's he's Mr. Doom. He's... Well, maybe maybe he um, he thinks that college is a racket, and he's like, I am a doctor because I know as much as any doctor that's out there. Uh, you can put me in jeopardy versus Jill Biden anytime, and I think I think I'd win. I well, mean, we're we're both evil, so you know. It... <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know Jill Biden. I don't know her. Well, she's a very good doctor. Probably one very of the good. best doctors, very, according very to the women of the view. We're we're going to jail. We I know this, <laughs> this show is getting removed from all the platforms that I say we're yeah. gonna be on. We uh, even salted two world leaders. The, yeah. <laughs> Victor Von Doom. Yeah. And anyway, Jill. Is it so, for Jillian? What is, is that? I don't know. Her full name. Hmm. What <laughs> what am I gonna call her? I, I hope to not have to even hear about well, her very soon i think uh i think tomorrow i'm gonna go to work and be like hey do you guys know the dr doom's not a doctor and, and i might have someone argue with me that'll be fun i yeah. might come armed, let me know, let me know armed with goes. information i mean how it goes these marines today they argue over stuff nobody nobody knows nobody's watched a single stitch of sports but they know about video games and comic books and i have no well, business being there I, I I I just Googled it, and the answers I returned are: he has a PhD in horribleness. Um, nobody did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, I don't know. So, I I didn't so, spend eight years at Doom Medical School to have people call me Mister Doom. That's what the internet has to say. So the internet's funny. Who knew? It's pretty good. Yeah. Is that? Did you? Were you on Black Twitter? Is that? What, <laughs> is, that is that where you were? No. <laughs> This is the best. Some sci-fi Twitter, nerd Twitter. So uh, what are we doing the show on? What's, what's Something the about topic? Con consciousness. So, <laughs> you know, last last week we talked about, uh, we talked about heaven. We did, yeah. And whether or not you yeah. go there or not. Right. And then, so I think at some point, you know, while we were talking last week, we, we spoke about whether or not your your spirit or your soul goes, right? Because that's, that's the argument, your disembodied spirit. And is your consciousness part of your it disembodied spirit? Is mm -hmm. that a thing? Or mm -hmm. when lights go out, do the lights go out? Like, um, so what? <laughs> what is consciousness? Does anyone have a have a their own definition of what that is? Well, I think the isn't the uh, the standard philosophical definition is if uh, if you can ask that question, you're conscious. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, 
I mean, that was that, that, the whole, only, I, I think therefore I am right. But then, but then that's, that's you. It's one of those experiential things, right? So you only know that you are, but I can't know that you are because the only thing I can observe is like behavior. What I do. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, as, so, as a behaviorist, point, I, I agree with that, with that the, uh, point the, of view. The point I think you're making is that there is no universally agreed upon objective scientific definition of consciousness. Yeah, I mean, is that, is that the point you're making? I don't, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to establish, well, you know, what, what I think terms that's mean a, before we we move along. I think that's a fair. I think it's fair to say that there's no def, defined way. There's no way to define it. I remember watching a debate with. Um, um <clears throat> shoot ben shapiro and i forget who the other person was but they were having a debate about uh, abortion <clears throat> about mm -hmm. abortion and when does life start when does consciousness begin Wait, so what, and, sentience yeah and it was around sentience and and it and then the person on the other side of the table made some argument about well if you don't have awareness and you don't have control of yourself you're not conscious and he goes so if i'm asleep i'm you can just kill me and they were like, well, okay, hang on, not when you're asleep, because you can be easily woken up. He's like, so what if I'm in a coma? And I think that was a really interesting thought experiment, if nothing else, because, you know, we always think about people as they're active, as they're alert, alert consciousness. But do you have consciousness when you're asleep? Do you have consciousness if you're in a coma? Like, I, I think you start going down that rabbit hole and it becomes relatively impossible to answer. Have you ever uh, heard of locked in syndrome? Yes. I'm a so, big. You got to remember, I'm a, I'm a I'm a big Metallica fan, so of course I know what locked-in <laughs> syndrome is right. Okay, so how do you how do you explain that? There's no behavior. There's well, no way to monitor whether or not they're conscious or not, but they can, are. Can you explain that for the listeners? So it's so like if you had like a stroke, right, and you're completely paralyzed, but you're aware of every single thing that's going on around you. You can hear, you can see, you can smell, you can, you can feel. You're just paralyzed. You can't react. So nobody knows that you're conscious. So, so that whole argument about sentience, right? Like, how do you know he's not conscious? Right. So, well, in, in how we how we observed is not that long ago. I, I think a, we need to just... distinguish though between being conscious in the sense that they're talking about, like being awake, and being a consciousness. I didn't. I didn't. I don't think who's they. I, I think we were, we were just kind of establishing what what there's there's like an intuition about what what this what consciousness is right and well, would, wouldn't you say there's a distinction but like that I, I mean of course you have to have you have to be a consciousness to be conscious but like we're, yes it seems like we're kind of talking about two different things here. what does that mean you have to be a consciousness to have well, conscious well like when you talk about whether or not someone is conscious like in the sense of being awake or like locked in syndrome that means that you're aware of the outside world but when you're but when you're asleep, when you're not conscious, you you are still a consciousness. Like you're you're, you're are you though? That's that was the point dreaming. that I was making. I well, don't know but, that that's true. But if you're dreaming, like it's that's you are there dreaming. You're having. I I would I would define consciousness as the capacity to the the quality or capacity or process of having experiences. Sure. Um, the, the of being a being a subject in the world. So, are there um, different levels of consciousness? Like, for for example, a slug or a caterpillar, or a bee. You know, those those creatures do have a central nervous system. They got a brain. They they, you know, but their but their level of consciousness is not going to be the same as ours. They're not going to experience things the same way that we do. Yeah, I think th I think that's a a valid question. I think that my pet lion is conscious. But she's not, uh, you know. But she's also closer to us than than an ant is, right? So, yeah. because because they have they have similar behaviors than us. When so mammals, you know, they they have types of pain. It looks like they take care of each other. They have they have behavioral tendencies that are kind of close to ours, so we can kind of relate to a... what an what a mammal does, right? compared to like an ant an ant has a has a different totally different experience in this world than than a cat or a dog or a, or a you know a, a monkey right so i think part of the problem is there's a little bit of a logic loop 
in these sure. words, right? So I just real quickly, the definition, you know, the, the internet definition of conscious um, focuses on being aware, right? Characterized mm -hmm. by having an awareness of one's environment or one's own existence. Yeah, that's and, the and point I was making before. That is. either or is the problem because I think we can easily argue that a cat is aware of its environment, right? If you open a can of food, if there's a mouse, if the house is on fire, they get those things. But is a cat aware of its own existence? Like that's, that's a deeper. How I mean, do you, we can't know because we can't ask. There's no way to know, like hundred percent no I way can, to know, right? We can I make can an ask assumption. you because well, you can tell me. And that's, right. and that's kind of where we're limited a, in all this experience, right? Um, you ever put a, I, well, I remember when I was three years old and I discovered myself in the mirror for the first time. You remember and, that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember it because my, I, I remember, I remember it precisely. I remember I was in my parents' room when my parents were still together. They divorced when I was three. So I, I know I was three years old. If, okay. At, at the, at the oldest. He's got reference points and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. yeah and, and we moved around a lot and there was a lot of like cheap you know, musical chairs happening in the okay. family. So I have these reference points. Sure. So I, remember I, I have, I have some, that's, it, it just but, sounds uh, weird to say, I remember when I was three, but I, but no, I, I, I remember, I'm with you. I'm with you. But I, but I remember like being on the floor and she had like this big, like long mirror on, on the, the ceiling. Floor, and I remember, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't and resist the my, joke. I'm sorry. And my mom is in the bathroom. I'm sorry, Brian's hair. mom. She, she doesn't <laughs> listen to this. But uh, I'm still sorry. Yeah. Well, she might one day, like this might pop up. Uh, maybe She's like that. But, Matthew. Uh, well, I just, I remember like discovering my reflection in the mirror and like, like discovering like the, I just, I was just totally mind blown, like coming to terms with this idea of my, of myself as a distinct person in the world. Cause it mm -hmm. seemed like before that moment, I was just sort of like, a disembodied I, I, thing kind of like i was just i was just sort of a an observer on the world in the world and i didn't think of myself as and i was i was a subject in the world but i didn't think of myself as another object within the world and it, i remember thinking like and why would you know that because you were three right <laughs> well and i and of course i wasn't articulating all this in my head when i was three i didn't i didn't have that that vocabulary but, but it blew your mind nonetheless but, but the but the concept of like recognizing like that is that's me right and like why do i look like that as mm -hmm. opposed to the way this my other mom and dad looks. look or the people and, on tv or whatever yeah and i was just kind of wrap trying to wrap my head around like well everybody like everybody else has this experience of being this distinct person in the world who's different from other people and but experiencing the world and i remember like my then my mom got was ready for whatever we were going to do and she's like okay let's go and i'm like and i was kind of mad at her because i was kind of having a moment there <laughs> but but i like i can't like that was sort of my first like kind of you know wrapping my head around what is it like to be conscious but what's interesting to me the the reason i bring that up is if you put like a dog in front of a mirror. I was about to ask you, thing. like, do you think that your cat had the same experience when she well, walked she, by a mirror? Well, she's blind now, so I can't test it. But, but I, I've 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 done it with my dog, and like he sort of like, you know, he, he tried to attack the other dog at first, but then he kind of he like he kind of sat there for a minute and was sort of like, hmm? and realizing that the you know, the reflection did what he did and that the toy in front of him and between him and the mirror, like was the same toy the mm -hmm. other dog was picking up. And, yeah. and he, I, like, I kind of think like, and yeah, they have done, they have done tests and I couldn't cite them because I didn't do any preparation for this whatsoever. Cause I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what we were, what we were going to do or where we were going to go with it. But uh, I mean, they have done tests that like dogs do have a sense of a sense of self and a sense of like, like, you know, their place in the social order of their families and that kind of thing. So they're not, so yeah, I think that they are conscious in, in much the same way that we are. Um, but, but, but does it have to be that complex for it to be consciousness? Well, that, that was what I was going to say. 
I, and I don't think so, right? Because yeah, I think an ant is conscious, right? That's, there's consciousness, but do you think a tree is? They, 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 yes, they are. They have a certain mm -hmm. level of reflexology. Um, you know, flowers open and tilt towards the sun. Um, you know, they know so, when it's nighttime. So, the, so they, so they have, they have memory, and and they have and they have reactions, right? Well, they also they, they communicate. Responding, responding to stimulus is not the same as being conscious, though. Are, are you uh, sure? depends on the definition that's that was my point about me looking it up to get to get like a like a textbook definition right so but how is it not you have to you have to have a memory well number one definition of sentient is having sense perception okay like what the I hell does that mean i i i wasn't gonna do this but there's this i i actually quoted it like in a episode like a year ago but there's this passage in sam harris is the end of faith where he talks about consciousness and kind of the 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 the, the body mind problem of consciousness mm -hmm. i think like it's it's kind of a lengthy passage i think it would be worth so reading so it. recently I, I i read his wife's book on on consciousness and uh listened to a, a couple of pretty lengthy podcasts where she explains some of the stuff so they might they might be kind of in sync in this you want me to get it i gotta get up and get it i'm gonna get it yeah, sure. Stop me. I'm so, it. <clears throat> but but my point is that the definitions are oh, circular and they're loose. They're loose on top of that, right? And it, I actually just laughed because um, it kind of reminds me of some of that, like, what is a woman kind of conversation? Because right. the definition of sentience, of, sen of being sentient, is one who has the faculty of perception, a sentient being. It's like, wait. Well, you can't use sentient to describe <laughs> right. sentient. Like, so it's kind of funny that we don't really have language <clears throat> that's capable of really articulating what is, because then it's like, well, then what isn't? I can say that in my, in my use of the words, I've always used sentient to mean self-aware and self-aware in the sense of like higher level self-awareness. Whereas conscious, I've always used it in a way that means having reflexes, having pain receptors, having right. feelings, and not it, feelings like emotional feelings, but just physical feelings, yeah. being able to, and, to... And a lot of people interchange those or conflate right, those words. Right, right. yeah. Um, so it, it's kind of weird because it seems like there's like a, there should be a, a continuum of consciousness. And I think like, cause Dre, you were kind of going to what about dogs? What about ants? What about plants? Right? right. Like, I think that's essentially you were kind of going down the rabbit hole of the, or the, the continuum of consciousness. Right. So like in, with, even, and even further than that, what about cells? What about DNA? Right. What about <laughs> organs? Right? right. A lot of, we, there's a lot of like memory cells mm -hmm. that are in, in the heart or in the liver all of the microbes and the in, yeah. in your whole like bodily ecosystem mm -hmm. is running whether or not you tell it to or not. Right. And is white, it because white blood cells are sensing right. you know intruder cells and they're attacking them and killing them. And those cells are fighting back and they're trying to survive. So, so what's 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 interesting is about all the sensors that we have in our entire body and how our brain processes it. Right. So so if you're if we're playing baseball, right? Mm -hmm. And a pitch comes and you hit it. Your eyes pick up the ball at a different rate than your ears pick up the sound of hitting the ball. Mm -hmm. And your hands also receive the sense of feeling it at a different rate than all of those things. Mm -hmm. And they all go into your mind and process at different spots, but spit out a simultaneous you hit the ball and you feel it. And they call that binding in your, okay. in your brain. Right. So much of the stuff that we, that we sense period is that binding that's going on in real time. Like they, they say that we can only perceive slash sense 1% of all the spectrum of information that's coming into your, you know, whether it be electromagnetic uh, light spectrum, all, all the things that you could, you could sense, and process we only process about one percent of it which is why we only have three dimensional 
you know, sight or, 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 or feel. Um, but what if you could sense something else or, or other animals that, that do have different senses, but mm. they don't have the same yeah. sight. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, well, um, and that's, so, uh, I think I've talked about her on this show. There's a, an author, uh, she's other things, but she's, and she's a PhD, by the way, a real one, not, not, not like Dr. Von Doom. Um, her name's Temple Grandin. And, uh, on doom <laughs> so poser. she's this guy's a poser right damn fraud um so temple grandin is a high functioning autist sure uh i don't know what her phd is in i think it's in psychology but uh i've got her book um it's super interesting and it's called animals in translation and i recommend everybody read it uh whether you're into dogs or you have kids um the long, sh long and short of the book is that she finds common ground between the way in which animals perceive stimulus and the way that autistic humans perceive stimulus, and mm -hmm. that that is different than how a regular human perceives stimulus. Now, obviously, she doesn't know the difference because she only has her own point of view. Um, what happens in the book is there's a rancher. He's running a feedlot. And for people that don't know what a feedlot is, it's the last place that cattle are kept where they're, they're fattened up before they're sent off to slaughter. And they run them through these big, long turnstiles or um, kind of, you know, like a maze of pipe fencing. It's essentially, it looks like Disneyland, right? Like all the people being funneled into it's a small world. And instead the cattle are being funneled into trucks. And that's how they load cattle into those big trucks that you see going down the highway. Um, well, anyway, this rancher had this weird problem where all of a sudden, and it never happened before, one day, all of the cattle refused to take a certain turn. And they just won't, they're going through the chutes and they just freeze. And they're like rearing up and they're causing this big kerfuffle. And he can't figure it out and he can't get the cattle to go through. And so he's calling around to all of his buddies and somebody says, you got to call Temple Grandin. And he's like, who the hell is Temple Grandin? They're like, she's kind of different, but trust me, call her. She's the cow whisperer. So Temple shows up. And she asks all these questions to understand what's going on. And then what Temple does is she gets in the chutes and starts walking through the chutes as if she was a cow. And she turns a corner and she stops and she goes right there. And he goes, what do you mean right there? And she walks over to the spot and she goes, the paint has been rubbed off of this and the sun is glinting off of it. And when I turn that corner, I catch a spark of sunlight in my eyes and it startles me. She goes, paint that. Farmer, the rancher paints it, cows shoot right through the thing. So it's a super cool story. Um, she doesn't turns, help people with cow problems. She helps cows with people problems. Well, so <laughs> sure. long and short, she, she created a certification process that made um, feedlots less stressful for the cattle, which then appealed to the, you know, the kinder, gentler side of humans. And so there's an entire beef industry that has to be certified by Temple Grandin's organization or else they won't buy the beef. Hmm. And one of those places is McDonald's. So McDonald's won't buy beef from a feedlot that's not Grandin certified. I don't know what it's called. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. The, 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 the high level gist that Temple pr explains in this book is that humans perceive uh, sensory data in as a picture. So if you walk into my house, you, you kind of have a mental picture. The TV's over there. There's a fireplace, there's couches, kitchens over here, right? Like you kind of just, that's how we see things. She explains that autistic people see every single detail as an individual thing. So if Temple walked into my house, she would go couch, buttons, another couch, more buttons, seat cushion, pillow, 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 ceiling fan, four lights, blades turning. Like she sees all of those things and she can't stop seeing them all. And that's why autistic people go into sensory overload and they have those little breakdowns where they start kind of, you know, remember Rain Man and, you know, he was yeah, like, oh, yeah. got to watch Wapner, got to watch Wapner. He was having a sensory overload. But the people's court <laughs> for all you young <laughs> listeners out there. Before there was Judge Joe Brown and Judge Judy. Yep. And it was Judge Wapner in the People's Court, but I digress. So <laughs> anyway, her point is, is that animals tend to see everything hyper-specifically because they don't have the ability to, to synthesize and rationalize all of it into an easily consumable. They don't think in terms of 
of uh, high level symbolic abstractions. Right. Like a home or right. a living room. Right. She would see a whole bunch of bricks and windows and the windows are square and that window's round. Why is that window round? Why is the sun reflecting? Like that's the kind of stuff that goes on in their heads. And she explained that's what goes on in most animals' heads that she can understand. Obviously she doesn't know, but her work product suggests that she's onto something, right? So sure. anyway, that was a long winded book, uh, book review. Super cool book. It's not a hard so, read and it's fascinating. So Tem Temple to, Grandin, Animals in Translation. Check it out. Just, just to kind of recenter the conversation, um, like we're talking about consciousness as a as a corollary to our discussion last week about what what does the Bible teach about going to heaven and that it doesn't teach that. Therefore, so now we're teaching what is consciousness, and so that we can have kind of a a working idea of what we're talking about when we talk about what happens to us after death. Right. Well, we're not teaching, we're hypothesizing, but yeah. Well, sure. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of what we're going for here, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Um, well, I found the book and the quote, uh, if you guys want to hear it, this is uh, Sam Harris's The End of Faith. Um, you guys ready for this? It's, it's, it's somewhat, it's somewhat lengthy, but it's worth it. Um, we'll be the judge of that. And right. so will the listeners. Okay. Well, this is in uh, the chapter Experiments in Consciousness on page 208. Uh, St. Mr. Harris or Dr. Harris now writes, I think he really does have a doctorate. Um, or is he a medical doctor? I don't know. Anyway, Dr. Sam Harris, while there is much to be said again, while there is much to be said against the naive conception of a soul that is independent of the brain, the place of consciousness in the natural world is very much an open question. The idea that brains produce consciousness is little more than an article of faith among scientists at present, and there are many reasons to believe that the methods of science will be insufficient to either prove or disprove it. Inevitably, scientists treat consciousness as a mere attribute of certain large brained animals. The problem, however, is that nothing about a brain, when surveyed as a physical system, declares it to be the bear a bearer of that particular interior dimension that each of us experiences as consciousness in his own case. Every paradigm that attempts to shed light upon the frontier between consciousness and unconsciousness, searching for the physical difference that makes the phenomenal one, relies upon subjective reports to signal that an experimental stimulus has been observed. The operational definition of consciousness, therefore, is reportability. But consciousness and reportability are not the same. Is a starfish conscious? No science that conflates consciousness with reportability will deliver an answer to this question. To look for consciousness in the world on the basis of its outward signs is the only thing that we can do. To define consciousness in terms of its outward signs, however, is a fallacy. Computers of, of the future, sufficiently advanced to pass the Turing test, will offer up a wealth of self-report, but will they be conscious? If we don't already know, their eloquence on the matter will not decide the issue. Consciousness may be a far more rudimentary phenomenon than our living creatures in their brains, and there appears to be no obvious way of ruling out such a thesis experimentally. Uh, da, 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 we could... Uh says a bunch of other stuff. The problem is that our experience of brains as objects in the world leaves us perfectly insensible to the reality of consciousness, while our experience as brains grants us knowledge of nothing else. Uh, given the situation, it is reasonable to conclude that the demand of our subjectivity constitutes a proper and essential sphere of investigation into the nature of the universe, as some facts will be discovered only in consciousness in first-person terms or not discovered at all. So... I find that highly ironic that, you know, Sam Harris of all people, one of the four horsemen of the new atheism movement would uh, be the one to deliver such a, an elegant and concise uh, discussion of the, you know, the, the problem of consciousness. Um, you know, there's I, I, no, why, why is, I don't why, know why, yeah, why, why, why is was, that surprising to you? Right. Well, he make he, he starts off by pointing out that it's a, it, it is a, on scientific terms, it is a matter of faith that brains produce consciousness. Um, it, his wife would call that intuition, something that we perceive and believe to be true. And sometimes your intuitions can change based on uh, evidence of something else. So that's where that that faith. I don't, I don't know. Well, I've, it, I've never and, really read Sam, but I have Annika. It, so, I, it, so I looked him up real quick while you were reading that, Brian, and his PhD is in cognitive neuroscience. 
Yeah. So he's not it's quite a, a he's not field. quite a doctor, but he's it's 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 in the physiology world, right? Well, but he's, he has a doctorate. Right, but he's not an MD. You said is he a medical doctor? And I said he has a oh. doctorate in a in in the world of physiology, but he's not a board certified physician in the science. Okay. So he's not an a MD scientist. is my point. He's a he's okay. a he's a cool. genuine PhD, but it, and it's in cognitive neuroscience. But right. but my point what I was going to say about that is that actually explains why he has that point of view that he does because I mean, this is kind of going down that same path of like, you know, Aristotle thought our brains were radiators and they dissipated heat, right? Like like that whole world of philosophy and and cognition and whatever has kind of been like what makes us us, right? And it kind of falls into the, you know Descartes and all of that kind of stuff with how do, how can you prove something that you don't know? Because I think in what you were just reading, he said, you know, does a, is a starfish conscious? There's no scientific way to say yes or no, <laughs> right? Because right. we like because Dre said, report. you can't have the conversation. So we have to we have to pick some other method of determining it, um, which is kind of what we said to begin with. I thought is that well, different and well. But his point there was that you, you, you can't determine it by any physical mm -hmm. observation. I, mean, I, I think that's where we were going. That's yeah, what that's what we, what we were saying. Yeah, that is what we're saying. Yeah, we we but, agree with we we might as well get where's my PhD. And you know what? And and, and thanks for having <laughs> uh, having Doctor Harris. You know, affirm what we're saying. Right. I appreciate. It. Yeah. Big big up stock. <laughs> that a boy, Doctor Har Harris. The reason and there's you know there. You know, there are volumes we could say about, you know, the reason I find that so fascinating um, from Sam Harris is you know, he mentions the Turing test mm -hmm. um, for the, you know, listeners who might not know what that is. Uh, there was a uh, mathematician and computer scientist named Alan Turing. They made a movie about him uh, played by uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, not about the Turing test, but he he wrote a paper in I think 1959 ish, um, addressing the question of can machines think or can we make machines that think? Mm -hmm. um, but kind of as as doc, as Dr. Harris was alluding to there, um, because the the you know the word the term think lacks any objective universal scientific definition for the purpose of the paper, he had to change the, the premise from can machines think to can machines do what we as thinking beings do, which is converse. And so that he devised what's called the Turing test, which is based on a, on an old uh, party game called the imitation game. It's what the, that's also the name of the movie because of this. Um, the imitation game is a man and a woman both kind of sit behind a, like a, behind curtains and uh or actually a man or a woman you don't know whether it's a man or a woman the person playing the game asks them questions and they they get like written answers or typewritten answers and they have to they have to determine if it's a man or a woman based on the answers they get back and obviously they can't just ask are you a man or a woman but they it, they kind of they're supposed to infer that by their answers the turing test is like Do you that. have a penis <laughs> That'd be the first question, right? Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Um, you have tons of facial hair and back hair. Um, ew. Uh, what if they? What if they said no and then yes? <laughs> but the, the Turing test is the Are same. Are you an ugly woman? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. That you you could never play that game today with. Uh, no, I could not. I would. Uh, well, first of all, I'd win, and. And, well, and just be loser at life. That's what I'm. Oh, be. and I forgot to mention, you can't see the person. Did I mention right. that? That's an important well, detail. I mean, they, yeah, you said they were behind a curtain, right? Okay, it, yeah, yeah. So it, unless it's a transparent curtain, like I don't know. <laughs> the uh, the Turing test is the same thing, except it, the the game is to determine is it a human being that you're talking to or a computer, and if the and if the person. And if people can't reliably tell the difference between the, the computer and a person, then it's said to be passing the Turing test and is therefore conscious, which of course is a terrible test because it's totally subjective. Um, you can make a, you can, we have AI that can emulate a human voice and can convince a lot of people that they're, that they're real. And I'm not. I'm not sure. I would necessarily know the difference between a an AI um, on the other mm -hmm. end of a phone 
if it's but if it, it's but is knowing the difference is is that the actual way of knowing well, so according to the turing test that's like the turing test that was 1959 we well, you and i are more advanced than that but but the point is nobody's come up with a better test since then like that's the best test we can come up with to Capture. answer the question like like the question of you know you know say we create ai like in the matrix um the question this paper puts to us that we still don't have a good answer to, a better answer to besides than the turing test is if we create a, a artificial general intelligence like an actually conscious machine program how would we know we did it <clears throat> I mean, we, we, we wouldn't, that was, and that's why we would have to establish whether or not consciousness is fundamental or emergent, right? So if it's fundamental, it means that everything in the universe is made out of the same materials, give or take arranged in different ways. But if it's all the same, does, does each particle have its own sense of consciousness or its own sense of, of, of being? Say that um, again. Plants and rocks are made out of the same basic materials that we are, right? Okay. If you if you break it down to atoms, We're carbon based, it's just car, it's just it's just arranged in different ways, and, okay. and here here we are. So, who is to say that all of that doesn't have its own experience? Because even within our own body, each piece of our body is is having its own experience that kind of kind of collates in our brain they did this pretty pretty cool experiment but to say but your uh, your arm is not having a different set of experiences than, are you sure than you are you sure yeah well, I'll, well i mean we'll get into it i've asked it you, you you've asked it and it, and it answered it didn't answer. That's that's that was my answer. Well, how do you know it didn't answer if it doesn't speak your language? Just like locked in syndrome, just like the ant, just like your cat. You well, and your arm and you don't have the same language. Well, the point is like, how are you distinguishing between my arm and me? I, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna go down something else and see if and see if that the experiment was. Can you create a new sense? So we have our senses. Can we can we manufacture one? And the sense that they tried to make outside was, of the five senses is that what we're talking about? Yeah. So okay. yes. So can you can you sense where magnetic north is? Humans can't do that. There are some plants. There's some sea creatures. There's birds that that can do that. So they've they they gave you tools, like a belt, and however they run these experiments until somebody actually can sense where magnetic north is because their brain is processing. And normally these processes take about six weeks to develop in your brain. Now, the person that does know where magnetic north is can't explain to you what that feels like. Really? They can try to tell you, but you won't get it. But the camaraderie between the people that did the experiment together had that experience and know exactly what it is. Also, like if somebody was born blind, how do you tell them what the color red looks like? Mm -hmm. You can't because they they've never experienced sight. Mm -hmm. But they do had they have this device called the uh, the mind port, and what the mind port does is that they they attach a camera to your body, and then they do like. Uh-oh. Looks like we lost Dre. He said his internet was acting flaky a second ago. Mm. <clears throat> I bet he's still talking. I bet he's making an awesome point. Uh, I, I'm Great intrigued this by this. Camera. Hey, Dre, you froze. Damn it. Yeah. So you froze when you said the mind Okay. Port? If you can go port. back to when you look like this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, that's so where this, you stopped. The, 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 the mind port. Uh-huh. Uh, Basically, it's a camera that's attached to you, mm. and the camera also has these uh, like like tactile pulses that go in your tongue. And at first, your tongue and your brain has no ideas what these pulses do. But after about six weeks of constantly doing this, your brain calibrates to the camera, mm -hmm. and you can see 
from the camera. And people have been able that were blind are able to navigate mazes. They're able to shoot hoops. There was a woman that lost her vision at the age of in her inner twenties. And then she says, I know what sight is. And this is sight. Really? So your brain can pick up other sensories from other things or types and learn what those are. And I find that pretty fascinating that you could no longer have eyes, but be able to see because your brain knows how to, uh, intake whatever <clears throat> infer sensor that it's, in, that's it's out inferring there. the the, yes. the 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 concept of vision well, it, 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 from other senses it 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 figures out how to process that information in what was formerly the mm -hmm. the, the visual center of the brain yeah. so like, what was that thing you said earlier dre you were using the baseball analogy and you're talking about uh binding binding yeah binding. it sounds like there's something some of that going on in this so i mean some scientists are, are saying that there's there's actual, you know, memories and consciousness within all the cells of your body, and they just collate in your brain. So there's each each organ has its own memory. Um, of course, there's you know those urban legends of the of the heart transplant, and the and then the the lady that was raped and murdered, brutally raped and murdered, and because she died and her heart was still good, her heart went to somebody else, and the person that received that heart could remember the experience of being raped and could identify the person that raped her and the murder was solved later. What? <laughs> Brian just said, what? No way. <laughs> you said, you, did you, did, did you start off saying that was an urban legend or? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, I'm, I've never actually looked it up, but it's been, it's been cited in several, <laughs> several uh, Ted talks and books and, and whatnot. Do you, do we do we know the name of the person that the... no no but we, I mean we can look it up later or or, or the, if, if you're listening right now that's say Andre you're full of shit that never happened and you go look it up for yourself and figure it out but yeah I don't I'm gonna be honest man I don't I'm gonna have I'm gonna need more confirmation before I buy that okay but a lot of you know I also and, and... And it's not necessarily that I'm I'm opposed to it in principle. It just seems like if something like that happened, that would that would have been like it'd be big news everywhere. That would have led the news cycle for for a minute. And well, we'd all, I think we don't know think, that person. I think name. nobody wants uh, maybe maybe Bill Gates and his ill. Apparently, the book is called it. the book is called The Heart's Code: Tapping the Wisdom and Power of Our Heart Energy by Paul Purcell. Purcell. That's the name of the book. Nice. It talks about the woman who got the heart transplant, and mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't rape; it was murder. Well, maybe was she was just, raped straight, also, but it was, straight, it was she was murdered though. And then the yeah. and then they solved the crime. They actually captured the dude and proved it was uh, him. An eight year old girl received the heart of a murdered ten year old girl. Began having dreams, recurring dreams of an actual murder. I'm pulling this off off Reddit, by the way, so God knows how accurate this is. It probably you know with the it's probably right there with Pizzagate. Right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm just being Jamie, you know? <laughs> so if, Ryan goes, that, that's not real. Jamie, look this up. <laughs> <laughs> and so if, if the cells in your body are all just sensors and you're, and you're, and you're living that experience, you know, basically you're living in the past <laughs> always because you're just putting information together. You know, the, is your brain just a processor and all of the rest of your body is just sensors. And if that's true, do you, do you just think you're you, but you're really not? Well, so, okay. So that's an interesting point because that segues into phantom pain. Right. Right. So Brian, anybody knows what phantom pain is, right? So there's you lose a lamb. You still feel the lamb. Yeah. There's countless stories of people that have yeah. had amputations and can still feel that limb that's been long gone, right? So you got your right leg cut off and then you're like sitting there and you're like, oh man, my right foot hurts. Wait, I don't have a right foot. You know, like that's a real thing. And they call that, they call it, uh, you know. Uh, Phantom pain. Yeah, but no one really knows what it is, right? Because obviously those nerves don't exist, but at some level, part of that nerve system still exists. And so it's creating positional expectations because it's expecting to feel certain things 
right? Well, what's the, the stories they talk about where they convince the people they're blindfolded and they're at a fire and the fire's burning and then they're going to put hot coals in their hands and it's actually ice cubes. And the people start right. screaming that it's burning their hands and they're convinced they have blisters all over their hands and it's ice and there's no way. Um, so, I mean, the brain definitely uh, creates conclusions based off of, you know, a chunk of, of inputs and there's no, and I don't know that there's any, you know, scientific or okay. clinical explanation for those T things. Tell me what you think about this experiment then. So there, there's brain scans that are hooked up to you and, and there's like some kind of clocking device. I don't know if it's hands or whatever, but basically what it does is when you see or make a decision to put your finger someplace, you can mark the time when you made that decision. But the people observing you can see in your brain at least a half a second before you made that decision. Mm. So was that you making the decision or was that predetermined you know, by something else? Right. Or, or, or an even trippier one is your, they stick your brain in an FRM, fMRI uh, device so they can see the blood flow and, and the things in your brain. And what they do is they flash two numbers on a screen. And the two numbers, you make the decision whether or not you're going to add or subtract the second number. And then you, you do the math. They can tell up to four seconds before you know what math you did. Not only that you did the math, but whether or not you chose if it was addition or subtraction. So it, at what point in the consciousness did you know or actually choose that you did something or you report that you did something because you chose to do it yeah but that's but your brain's processing regardless right 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 when do you consciously know that you made that decision so why is why is the assumption that you're not making the decision and rather the res the residual memory of your decision is just slower than the decision itself maybe is that it, not it, was that it, not would that not be a plausible counter argument to that so like you know um i was i was watching something and they were talking about this guy was talking about rabbits and that when a rabbit's being chased by a wolf or a cat whatever right it's running for its life that rabbits have this ability to do random movements hop kick right stutter step do a backflip, right? While it's running for its life to juke sure. the, the bad guy. The rabbit doesn't actually know what it's doing. They've done these same brain scans to determine that there's no brain activity from the conscious part of the rabbit's brain making this happen. It's all lizard brain or whatever that's causing these rapid movements to happen, right? And the, the conclusion is that if the rabbit knew what it was gonna do, it would develop tells. Like right. it would, it would shift its weight before it kicks left or whatever. Or it and would that be over. Slow. Well, no, it, but this is what this was just their yeah, conclusion okay, okay. that I was. I'm, it's re, an I'm just evolutionary reporting. adaptation to get away from wolves. Because otherwise, the wolves would learn how to read their their tails, and then they would be able to cut them off. Right? It's like a linebacker watching a running back's hips. Right? He knows he's going to shift this way, but if the run, running back didn't know he was going to juke right, he could juke right even better than Barry Sanders did when he was the best at sure. it. Right? So. The logic there is that there is an ability for the brain to do some things disconnected from consciousness, right? Just like our respiratory system, et cetera, right? You don't think about breathing until you are thinking about breathing. Or is your respiratory system have its own mind? Is it your brain doing it or is it your respiratory system doing well, it? Well, what do you mean by a mind? Right. I was about to say the same thing. Like, what do you, what do you, what your do you brain. mean? Yeah. Your no. brain. Well, well, you say you said it has its own mind. So, so what the, do you mean do when it says when you have, say mind? Like you're not asking, is there another brain inside your lungs that just operates your lungs? Right. I, I, I'm saying that is there something other than your brain that that makes things go? Well, so if you take two stem stem cells, it, it, it's about their environment. Two stem cells with the same DNA. If you put them in two different petri dishes, and you give it the environment 
one of them will become bone and the other one will become skin. But it's the exact same thing. So what what caused it to do that? It's the environment that comes in. It's it's outside sources. So, you know, Bruce Lipton, who's a who's a scientist, a, a microbiologist. Uh, sorry. And, and, you know, he, he has a, a epigenetics where basically it's an outside stress factors is, is what causes, you know, cells in your body to react a certain way. And, and another guy You're talking Greg about Gray, like, like, like cancer responses and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Well, and well, everything, every single thing that it does. Okay. Uh, and even so, you know, you develop a lot of things as a child because that's the experience that whatever your cells did, they have that memory that's stored in your DNA. The good news is, is these people think that you can change that by using subconscious thoughts for like 10 minutes a night and change your entire mindset on every single thing that, that you like believe in. Whether it's, you know, be in a good mood, you can cure cancer this way. You can I, cure I, remember, all kinds of I remember when I was in junior high, I had a, my science teacher, of all people believed in this. And it's, this had to have been super bleeding edge woo woo stuff back in 88. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was like eighth grade, seventh grade. His name was stalker. I remember his name because his, his first name was Joe and we called him stalker jokes. We thought we were cool kids calling teachers by their first names. So I'll always remember that guy's name. But he had, he came in one day and was telling us that you can choose to not be sick. And we were all like, what? And he goes, I decided three years ago, I'll never be sick again. And I haven't been sick since then. Mm. Like, that was just, he, that's about all he said about it. No, no, no. It, it would take work just like the six weeks it takes to use your brain to use a camera as eyes. Right. Right. So you have to be, it has to be consistent, you know. You, there's a there's a mind connection to all the cells in your body. It's um, interesting. So, what can we conclude about consciousness from all this? Don't know, and that's I, and that's the kind of the the beauty about it. I don't I don't I don't think I don't think we can. I, I I think the only thing we can conclude about consciousness is what we're able to either observe or communicate. Which was the point very early in in this in this and was what, it's what Sam Harris said in, in all seriousness, so, right? Like, it's, so it's what if you like could a, figure out figure out a way to to share experiences with without without communicating? And I know a couple of weeks ago I, I had talked about like belief in Jesus, right? And you know, and I made analogies of you know some native girl out somewhere in the you know in the field. And she experiences the love of Jesus, but she has no Bible. She has no prophet telling her anything, no preacher, nobody preaching the good news to her, but she knows God. I, I think that's possible. Um, yeah. If we uh, listen to Paul, his sermon to the uh, Athenians at, at Are the uh, Areopagus, he said, uh, uh, from one man, God made every nation of men and determined the time set for them in the exact places where they where they would live. He did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, although he is not far from each one of us. From each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Um, so yeah, I think if God did that so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, then he is he's findable. He's not far from each of us, as Paul said. Um, I mean that's that's. That's possible, according to what Paul said, but it's it's, but it doesn't it doesn't happen typically or often. Um, not because God is far away, but because human nature being what it is, we don't we don't seek God. So um, Einstein's first first when we think about his theories, they were he said that they were intuitions. And the problem with his intuition was that he couldn't convey what that was. It took him decades to figure out how to tell somebody what, what he means by what he knows is true or believes that is true. 
So if there was some kind of way that we could censor, but I don't know what kind of dimension or what kind of piece of the spectrum um, that, that maybe, maybe that's something we lost. Maybe that was part of the tower of Babel. Maybe we did have some sort or, of or telepathic Eden. ability or, or just communication ability that didn't have anything to do with speech. Could have been. That's a, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. If we lost, he, well, he confused our language. And what if our, we hear the word language and we assume it's all verbal. And what if it wasn't all verbal language? What if it was another, a sensory on the spectrum of yeah. something or, or it's also you could argue that maybe that's something that came out of the, the expulsion from from Eden as well. Sure. I, I I I I disagree with that, but it's kind of involved. Like I've kind of gone into it before with the the role of language in creation and how we're like how central language is to our humanity and being made in the image of God. I like I have a hard time. Well, that's because you're 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 distilling language down into into words. What if what those words are not what we know what words are? What if, what if they're trying to say that it's just a a way to communicate something that we can't that I'm I'm having a hard time even saying what I'm thinking about right now because there's no way there's nothing in my language that can that can convey that thought. Um. Because because if if you're telling me that, then you're telling me that the Bible is literal with everything that it that it, that it says. I'm not. I, I, how am I saying that? Because you're saying that 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 the role of language, and that language has to mean what then, Brian? Uh God spoke the universe into existence. So speak the way God. we think that speak is. Speak the way that we know that words come out of mouth. Right. I mean, why why is that the thing? I, well, the the alternative is. I mean, it sounds like you're talking about like direct consciousness to consciousness communication without language in between language no, i'm itself... saying that, i'm saying that there might be a way to communicate that we don't know about okay if well, we can yeah. learn what magnetic north is or i can learn to see without my eyes why is there not something else that i can't even fathom or can or, or conceive of that that can, we 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 can enter into communication. Okay, I guess, sure. I mean, I don't I don't know. I, I'm not sure what that means. Um, and I'm not like I don't I don't know exactly where we are or where that how that relates to the, the you know the the big topic. So I don't I don't know what to say about that. But. Well, I think what I what I'm getting from it, what I think what I think Trey's getting at is is if communication can can occur in a way that we don't understand, then that would require consciousness to exist in a place that we don't understand. I think is the simple point that Dre's making. I mean, I different don't, species. I don't know if he means it that way. To, uh, but different if, species communicate different ways too, right? Like the tomato plant. If a if a caterpillar is eating too much of the of the plant, then it it has a memory and it has some kind of sound. It knows how many chomps it takes. For that to happen so then it puts out a chemical a that wasps, or whatever. wasps all of a sudden feel or hear this and they mm -hmm. come and they devour the, the caterpillar there's another plant that once it gets eaten it puts out a chemical and then the caterpillar is like i don't want to eat you anymore we're going to start eating each other because that's just the defense mechanism and, and that's a communication thing that they have with different animals and we I'm don't not... understand that but yeah, I'm not sure that communication there... in the same sense. Like we kind of we we speak of that in terms of, you know, what we're, we're communicating right now. I'm saying words. You're getting them over the internet, over Zoom, right. and you're hearing. And we're we're talking, and and like you, it, I'm I'm a consciousness talking to you, and you're a consciousness receiving it, and you're, and like that's what we mean by by communication. And then we kind of use that that language as a shorthand for what happens in nature between plants and hornets and caterpillars and stuff like that but they're not necessary i don't think that they're communicating in the sense that the hornet gets the stimulus and then it's think it's 
it's consciously processing it the way that we are with our communication thinking oh i need to go over to that plant and take it's out because that caterpillar. We're, we're a complicated we're, we're more <laughs> complex than that not to mention well, the reason why we can communicate is because we're like beings because we hmm. have a very similar experience on this world so the words that i use you would kind of understand because you're you're living a uh, an experience that's really like mine, where if I were to talk to your cat, we don't have the same experience. But it's more well, similar between me and your cat than but, me and the plant outside. But, but my point is like our you and I are you and I are communicating in a literal sense because our computers are communicating in in a you know, in a, in a figurative sense, we, we talk about the communication between my computer and the server and traveling through the, you know, through the internet to get to your server that communicates to your computer, but they're not, they're not communicating in the sense that they are getting the information and having, and having the experience of thinking about it. It's, we're really just integrating I have I have a system that I call a computer that I connect to a larger system of which your computer is a part, but they're not like it's not an an individual communicating with another individual with another individual the way that the three of us are talking. And I think that's kind of how it is with the animal world. Like they're not like a, a caterpillar might be having it, its own its own little caterpillar experience, and the plant is is being subjected to stimulus, but it's not thinking. It's not, it's not having the experience of thinking, hey, this caterpillar is eating me right now. I'm going to call my friends the hornets. And then the hornets get the call. And then the hornets think, oh, I need to go do that. No, it's just a it's a it's an integrated system of nature in which the plant gets a stimulus. It it sends out another stimulus to another organism and it reacts and it's they're not they're not they're not consciousnesses acting on information. So I, I think we're well, just, we're I, just I, systems I, of I, nature I, doing I think, the same thing. I think one's oversimplifying and one's undersimplifying, right? Um you the in, in Dre's analogy or his his ex, his example, there's certainly signals being sent, right? There's signals being received and signals being sent. And that causes other organisms to do something, to act on that, right? Whether or not there's a higher level of consciousness in the middle of it doesn't change the fact that communication occurred. Well, I mean, if it's I like all if, the microbiomes that are in your body if, right if, now, if, if, if your cat jumped up and scratched you, right, you would like, ref, you would reflexively like either swat it away or grab your leg or go ow or something. Sure. And none of that would happen because in your brain you went, hey, my cat just scratched me. I should swing my hand at it to make it stop scratching me. But right? that's like, not this, but that's not but you're using communication in two different senses there. And, and you're, I'm not. You're, I'm using the same. You are. No, my I'm cat not. jumping up and causing me pain so that I have an involuntary reaction. That's not communication in the sense that if you were to text me information like, hey, me and Dre are at the thing meet us at such and such time and we'll get drinks. I got information. Now I have to decide how I'm going to act on that information. Like that's communication in the literal sense. If I'm just, if I'm just getting stimulated by some, some external stimulus and I'm, and I'm having, and my nervous system involuntarily reacts, that's a totally different thing. Unless, Does it involuntarily uh, hang on, reacts? hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Unless Every time your cat ran out of food, it did that to you. And if over a period of four, five, 10, 20 times of your cat scratching you, you recognize that your cat's out of food. So then the minute your cat scratched you next time, you're like, ah, shit, my cat's out of food. I and agree then, with that. I agree with that. Okay. Absolutely. That's that's, And that is my point. Well, I mean, if, if, if not for that, you got to add that unless for that to be communication, for that to be information. But that's, that that's, getting, but, but the only difference between that situation and the and the caterpillar situation that Dre that Dre mentioned is we're all making an assumption that there's no consciousness that's driving any of that behavior in that chain. And, is there and, is there a reason to assume that there is consciousness? No, but at, but it's but you don't no, you, but, but you can't you can't discredit the one theory by saying there's not a there's no there's no suggestion in either direction, so we don't know. 
but what we do know, pretty, I think there's a pretty strong suggestion that 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 caterpillars and hornets and and especially plants are not conscious in anything resembling. I don't think that's true are. at all. I mean, if you used a mirror, I mean, if you want to say they're not anything resembling the complexity of us, then fine. Yeah, I mean, but... there's 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 absolutely stimulus response that's shown to be real and it's not just like a, a a single option of response to different stimulus by creatures animals plants whatever like and, and plants but, have shown that they but, have memory right that like you you can't there's not only that they change with the seasons but a lot of plants won't bloom unless they've had a certain number of cold days which they count and they know uh how do we there's, how do we there's know a that? there's a certain uh photos like slow slow motion photos that they like speed how, up like, the time. i mean how do we know that the plant is counting? because it won't because it doesn't bloom until and i mean you we've observed plants long enough to have seen these experiments and but, we've and we that, know that but but hold, that's that's a you you understand what an enormous leap that is from we have photographs that the the plants don't they, bloom until next time from that to they're they're counting in their heads how many days it's been because because they've 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 cut it short before and then it never blooms well I, hang on, hang on. yeah dre what brian's saying is there could be a whole host of internal chemical timers versus it being conscious thought of the plant going that was one night two night three night four night that's what that's what he's saying but then but then but what the fuck is the difference? How do we well, know that that's not well, what our brain is doing? Well, we, 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 hang on. we don't. That well, hang on. Because, yeah, because hang on. just because we can convey that doesn't mean that we aren't having the same chemical reaction in our own brain just because I can speak to you about it. it no, but it, but it certainly doesn't. The, the leap, the leap isn't that because we can't prove that they're not, it must be conscious thought that's causing it to happen. I didn't say plant. must be. I, I, I said that. Well, it, you, you might have misspoke, but I, I, I think that's what you, I think those your actual words were that we know that they're counting. And well, if, I mean, if you had said perhaps it's, it's they're an counting, indicator that they're counting, how about that's, that? That's a different, right? that's a different or conversation. The, or the Venus flytrap that knows the difference between a raindrop hitting it and a fly that lands and then it closes up and smashes it and eats it, right? Because, because it knows, because it has to have a certain number of hairs in there that are with a certain amount of pressure with a certain amount of, you know, my favorite stat about the Venus flytrap is it doesn't need those bugs for its nutrition. It chooses it, violence. It's just mean. It's just, well, I, I, no, I, seriously, like I, I've, that's, yeah, that I've read, like you, Dre, a Venus flytrap I, I think, can go its whole life with no bugs and it'll survive. Dre, I think I think you're doing a God of the Gaps type argument with consciousness. Like what? it's. I don't think he God, is. I don't know think what he a God is. of the Gaps argument No, is. I don't. That's why I said what? What? Well, don't be mad. I'm just. I'm, I'm I can asking. be mad. I can be mad if I fucking want. All right, be I'm mad, not mad, but right. <laughs> but don't well, tell me I can't be mad. I'm now. I'm mad. But what is the god of gas? Or a suggestion? Don't. I mean, don't hit me, man. I can't hit you. You're lucky. Uh, I have... <laughs> so anyway, god of the gaps is. But what... maybe I can teach this computer one day to think consciously to hit you when I tell it to. You. But we so we we're agreed that it's not conscious though. The computer. The computer. Yeah. I think I today, think a, I think that's a discussion. Not right yeah. this moment. It's not. And, and we can't relate to it because even its processes, its system is not the same as ours. Right. So there's no way we can relate to any type of biological system. It would use a different system to think. I don't know. The God of the gaps argument is it's it's the thing that the atheist accused uh, sometimes rightly Christians of doing like if we if we can't explain something that happens in science, it's God did it. Um, we can't explain. Um, you know. Some phenomenon of nature. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with examples because most sure. of the time they they accuse us of God of the gaps arguments. It's, it's a fallacy, but uh, I think, I think one of them is uh, the complexity of like, you know, the human eye is one that I've seen recently that the, the level of, of uh, evolution that would be required for our eye to work the way that it does. Well, is so improbable. See, that, that's not a God of the gaps argument because that's, that is, it's one, it's not a God of the gaps argument is not 
like the observed phenomenon positively points to God, like that's would be evidence for God. The a God of the gaps argument would be like we can't explain why the eye is so complex. Um and that's literally don't... what I just said. Well, but hold on. The the idea of irreducible complexity to the eye, if that's if that's if that's a genuine attribute of the eye, that does point to God. Because that means the eye can't exist at any uh, like it can't be a there can't be a more primitive version of it, and it still be any kind of useful organ that that natural selection would favor. Um, so that I, like that wouldn't actually be a god of the gaps argument. A god of the gaps argument would be like when Ray Comfort, um, he's he was a he was he's a televangelist. He used to do this thing with Kurt Cameron. He would uh, explain how the banana is perfectly shaped to conform to the human hand and it has this handy handle that 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 perfectly suited for humans to peel and this is proof that god designed it um oh wow little that does did ray comfort realize that well bananas are don't occur naturally in, in the wild not in the way we, that we have them we cultivated them yeah we specifically bred them to do that um, and, and since God made us and we did that, that's proof. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, just regarding irreducible complexity, that's, yeah, that's, that's from Michael Bahey's uh, Darwin's black box. It's kind of a popular um, intelligent design argument. It's, I, I, I've heard, I mean, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time discussion. Well, let's just, let's just accept the Michael Bahey version of it. Um, that would be an example of the evidence positively pointing to God. It's not we're not just defaulting to God because we want to believe in God and there's no there's no other explanation that we can we can conceive of. Um, like but with consciousness, it seems it seems like because we don't know how the Venus flytrap distinguishes between a raindrop and a fly, therefore it's but we do we do know how it does. Okay. Just because I don't know how it does, but the I've heard people explain why it does and how it does. And okay, does it is is the explanation that it is observing the differences and consciously thinking that's a fly versus that's a raindrop? Or... No, it 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 knows so many hairs can be touched at the certain amount of time uh, for the certain for the sort of the length of time and the number of hairs touched on whatever surface that is inside the venus ply trap it knows that it's a bug and not something when else. you say that it knows that it's a bug do you mean that it is like consciously processing information to 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 rationally maybe may, maybe or do you mean that it has a, a, a it's adapted a a number of you know you know, what is the difference? The di there's a world of difference. What's um, the difference? Consciousness is the difference. Um, you can't use the word to describe the word. What? What? what what's like the this difference? is this is like how, a what is a woman kind of argument. How is how would no? But how is that different than me hearing certain sounds and me synthesizing those sounds to have a meaning of because I'm more complex than a Venus flytrap. That's not, that doesn't prove that there's consciousness. It, it proves that something causes me to... So whether it's causal or, I don't know, fundamental. Well, I would say that the act of you, like, hearing some music and just repeating it for whatever reason, that's not necessarily a component of your consciousness, but your your ability to reflect on it and recognize that you did that and to and to assign meaning to it, that is consciousness. I, I don't think a Venus flytrap is reflecting on, you know, the meaning of the of of it, it doesn't. So so now you just redefine the word. Yeah, because a, a dog or a cat couldn't which, do that. Which which word have I redefined? Consciousness. Consciousness. You just re redefine it. Saying I only <laughs> only only animals that can reflect has consciousness. Dogs cannot reflect. 
or maybe they can in, in any way that we can any, not in any way that we can we can observe un, observe and 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 quantifiably and, and re- point reported to. to us um i mean i appreciate that you believe that that's what consciousness means and i don't i don't have quibbles with that i'm just saying that you redefine the word i don't think i redefine the word i mean i don't think that i don't think that a venus flytrap has a self that is having experiences. A Venus flytrap is a bundle of, of systems that respond to stimuli. It's, so are we. Not... We're a bundle of systems that, re- yeah. that, that so respond Brian, to this, stimuli. This might have been when you but, when you when you went not, to get your book. But so we're not tr- merely a bundle of systems responding to stimuli. That's right. my point. So when you went to get your book, Dre and I continued to talk, and you might have missed where we had this part of the conversation, but the, 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 the real interesting challenge with the word consciousness is much like the, you know, the, the, what is a woman discussion? Most definitions use the word consciousness in the definition of consciousness. And so it kind of just further proves how complicated the, the conversation is and around. Why can't it, why can't it be? A, a, a and, and so what I was saying was there's, it's almost like there's a continuum of consciousness, right? Because Dre kind of went to the the animal, the ant, and then the the plant, right? The, and it's almost cell, like period. like there's at this level there's cellular stimulus response, right? And then that goes to like human consciousness, and there's a lot of things in between, you know, a white blood cell responding to something in the body that shouldn't be there, right? Because they do that, and then there's human consciousness like the three of us are having ostensibly but and, but really and i, and I say that because are are we right like it, it's, but it's if, just the brain processing all of that stimulus and and so and because and, we can communicate what that stimulus means to us and and the, there, there's a point to all this by the way and for listeners that have lost the the ball um i, I think I, i'm gonna be I, honest i've i've lost the ball so this conversation was was born of a fault a, 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 it's a residual of last week's episode where we were talking about heaven and we were talking about the spirit and what happens to us after death and this is a, a rabbit hole that dre's been chilling in around where our consciousness is relative to our spirit our soul etc um so th- it, it's really a a thought experiment around what does it mean to be us and how much of us continues to exist outside of our body and or with our reborn bodies. So it's kind of like all of this is linked and we're maybe down in a, a bit of a, a black hole of, of thought experiments and discussions, but that's where the, that's kind of where this, idea in this conversation came from right so we were it, it was uh you know if and when you die um the three of us were in at least um tacit agreement that we don't immediately go to heaven as disembodied spirits but or there is at all go to right heaven. right but the point is is that then the following question is is what then happens to our level of awareness our consciousness in that period between the Edenic rebirth of heaven and earth and the, and the restoration of our heavenly bodies, right? So there's, there's, that's one question. And then the second question is, are, if our heavenly bodies are materially different than our earthly bodies, how much of that body's existence is a part of our consciousness, right? So how much of our consciousness is the same or could be the same in that moment of rebirth? I think all of this is part of the kind of the natural flow of that conversation. And does it matter? No. Like, it, it is, it is any of this affect whether or not the Bible is true? No. Like, this is, this is periphery that I find interesting. Um, there's no answer to it, by the way. Like none of us, are, we're not going to solve this one. Well, Sorry, John. I, like <laughs> we're not going to solve consciousness tonight. Um, it, it's really more of an exercise in how much we don't know about what we don't know than it is about what we know about what we do know. Um, 
Yeah, and I think uh, Dre, were you about to say something? I was. I was just curious. This is like one of those, you know, <laughs> uh, like that meme where the girls like, I bet he's thinking about other women. Like, no. <laughs> I was. I'm thinking if if I had a brain transplant, would I still be me? And that's so. If 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 I if if for some reason I died right now, my brain was still functioning, and Brian needed a brain because he had some kind of stroke. So Doctor Frankenstein got, kind of stuff. And my brain got put into Brian's body. Would Brian be Brian or would Brian be Dre? Right, and I I think I hypothesize that Brian would be Brian because he would just have a new processor for all of the memories that's all over his body. So every one of his cells have been working in tandem with his wow. brain and processing. So within six weeks, we'll just say he, his body would be in sync with his new processor and he'd probably have some memories of mine and some, I don't know, maybe he would, he would uh, be able to sing or something. And then <laughs> how do you know I can't sing? <laughs> I, I think he would, I think he would be Brondre. The bro which would be dope as fuck. Right? <laughs> Uh, and then he and then he would experience the sure. mind the yeah. mind of Dre, and then he wouldn't have all these questions that he has for me on this podcast because he would just experience what it's like to be me and be like, "Oh fuck, that's what he was trying to say," and he just didn't know how to communicate it. But now that I experience being him, like it's all good. Which which kind of lends to like an Eastern philosophy that that there's no separation, that we're all the same from the same matter from the same. Um, I think that if your brain got put in my head. I would just be dead and you'd be, you'd be <laughs> well, you would be well, me. That that would be an, like you an would, unsuccessful you, brain brain transplant. Like this, right? this no, he said, you'd be, he said you'd be Dre. I, this, <laughs> this, this would be Andre Br Bibbs white. Oh, so, so you're opposite of me. You think you, that, that all your consciousness is in your brain? I, I think that the, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, I think that, that having the experience of being in, somebody else's body other than the brain would probably would that would affect your consciousness that would like you would you would you would know what it's like to be in my body what's your evidence that the brain stores memory um because people have received uh head injuries and lost memories before is that because it stopped firing to all the other places in your body. So it doesn't process that anymore. Or is it because your memories are stored in your brain? I think it's because your memories are stored in your brain. Um, I, I don't, but okay. But I mean, but, but I don't, you, neither but, of us have evidence of this, but so. I'm, I'm, but I'm not dogmatic on that, but I, I do think that, I mean, and I don't, I'm not, and I'm actually less interested in like where exactly in the body any given component of consciousness or memories reside than if that if consciousness itself exists independent of the body. Okay. Okay. So I have, so for both of you, cause you're both on different sides of this. Now I have a fun question. I don't, Could, but that's my point. That's, that's the no, point I was just making right now is I'm not, I'm not sure we that's fine. necessarily I, are. I don't need you to be dogmatic on it. Just, Play along with this now, because I have a really good thought experiment to go along with for both of you. Nice. So, so can I make so, one more point before you do this? Because it might sure. Because then I'll be done, and I want sure. to stay on this. And there, there have been instances where people had severe epilepsy. Was it epilepsy? Or no, I'm pretty sure it's epilepsy. And they, the treatment was to remove one hemisphere of the person's brain. Mm -hmm. And that cured the epilepsy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like, you know, uh, as we as we conventionally think of the brain as the seat of consciousness, that's half the person gone. But the other side of the brain just sort of right grew in and right. fill fill and and the person didn't experience any any like any difference in who they felt themselves to be or or you know they were blind in one eye, but. I, I think that that hang on, actually hang on. Don't jump ahead. My point. Don't jump ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Don't go jump ahead. ahead. Damn it. I've yeah. got a, I've got a good question. So similar to that, what you just said, Brian, I was kind of going down the same places. What about in this, in the, you know, back in the, I guess it was the 1800s, maybe early 1900s when we were doing lobotomies, I guess that's as, as late as the late 1900s or the mid 1900s. I'm pretty sure that's what, an early 20th thing. 
Yeah, when we were when we were conducting lobotomies for like psychosis and different kinds of you know schizophrenias, et cetera. Yeah, we didn't um, start doing that till we had general anesthesia. But anyway, sure about that? the timing the timing but, doesn't whatever. really matter. Yeah. Well, I'm just, so I'm in, in that in in those instances, people were materially changed. Now, not necessarily for the better, but they were materially changed, and their behavior was modified. Well, they were docile and. That's that still that still fits what I said clinically speaking. I'm yeah. speaking clinically. I'm not speaking psychologically, right? But they were there, you know, that they were like wildly aggressive. That came down, but they could still walk and eat and kind of you know do do but ambulatory they were things. Vegetables, right? So, how does that play with either of your theories? Because I think it kind of plays with both of them at the same time, right? I think it does. Yeah. That, that I, was, I think you, you, all your processing has changed. That's why. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the epilepsy, right? You you no longer process that portion until your brain learns how to reprocess that. Right. It's just like I had a stroke, so there's there's a section of my brain that was turned off completely, mm -hmm. and I lost. I had paralysis all over my right side. Mm -hmm. And your brain has it healed. Slowed. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and I don't I don't believe that consciousness is strictly in the brain. Um, I mean, as a consciousness now, I'm feeling my they entire body. Like Forty thousand different—I forgot the word—but it's pieces of memory that's in your heart, and like emotions come from there. Well, as well, and and there have been there there have been a lot of studies in the past few decades that have that have kind of tied intelligence and and cognitive function to athletic ability. Like it's not like your brain, like your 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 brain is the center of, of your cognition, but it's not, it, it's, it's the, right. It, it's where your entire bodily system kind of, kind of, you know, comes together processes and like, but it's your entire, your entire nervous system is kind of part of the same organ as your brain. The total system. Yeah. Your, your brain is essentially the CPU, but you have RAM, you have hard drives, you have all of the other things that can exist these, everywhere else. All yeah. these systems. Right. So and if you have like really function good check, I, sir. health, What'd you say? He said function, function check, check. I, sir. Oh, um, I thought you I thought you said like, okay, checking out, guys. Bye. I thought you were <laughs> I, I'm actually I'm actually splitting the rage quit. <laughs> I'm gonna split the difference between the two of you. And I'm gonna take it a step further because I am not one that adopts the concepts that animals have higher level cognition in any way, shape, or form. Um, well, hang I, on. I, let me finish. I, let me finish my point. I, I, I just want to clarify what I'm saying. So I believe that your consciousness, in the way that we talk about human consciousness or sentience, is a combination of your entire bodily system, heavy emphasis on your brain, and your, for lack of a better term, and Brian, I know you're not going to like this, your immortal soul. I think I think it takes the two to make the sum total of what makes a human. And I think that's what that's that's why we're different from the rest of the animal kingdom and more specifically the non-animal kingdom. I think I think all organisms have a certain level of awareness with, with regards to stimulus and stimulus response. And I think as they go up the food chain, there's more higher level consciousness, but in order to have our level of higher level consciousness, it requires something that's beyond the body itself. Um, why do you say I won't like that? I know you don't like the soul as a, as a conversation point, because you've talked about the pneuma versus what's a soul well, and is it tangible versus intangible and all that kind of stuff. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you mean by tangible, but I also don't know what you mean by immortal soul. What, what, what is that? That's exactly why I said you weren't going to like it. I don't know why you played coy and then went right back to what I said you were going <laughs> to well, like. No, I'm just. Know, right? but I, that's that's a valid question. I'm not. I'm not asking that to be argumentative. I'm. I'm. What do you mean when you say immortal soul? I I I don't know how to. I don't know how to quantify it. It's the. I, I feel like I actually said what I think it is. It's the thing that makes us different that God gave us, and it's what and it's and it's where the whole image bearer thing differentiates us from the from high level primates. And from any of the other animals of the animal kingdom, and I don't know, I don't know what it means. It's it's something supernatural that exists in us that's heavenly. It's divine. It's it's the component of us that is God. Is is there something in the Bible that you're basing that on that that we can not it not not that you could not that you could extract in 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 literary terms. It would require it would require kind of like 
reading it all and then creating a, a point of view and then reading back into it. So it I say take, Jesus. Take an, an intuition. Yeah. It, it just, it's just, it, like I said, I, I can't point to a chapter. Um, cause we, cause last week we did talk about what, you know, as these, as these terms appear in the Bible, what they actually mean. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the words, you know, the, the, Numa means English, breath. Yeah, no, I get English it. English word soul comes from the Greek psyche, just means mind, consciousness, mm -hmm. comes from nefesh in Hebrew, which just means any living organism. There's mention of a dead, of a, of a corpse as a dead nefesh. Mm -hmm. So like just, you know, scripturally speaking, there's nothing that explicitly says that, that we have a so-called immortal soul that survives the death of the body. And also, like the idea of, you know, you know, and if we do have an immortal soul, is that intrinsically immortal? Like, does it live on of itself, or does it only live on because God gives it life again in the resurrection? Those, like, those are well. So I'll answer the question this way: What's a demon? A demon is a malevolent spirit. Right. What's a spirit? A spirit is a disembodied being who is, well, I'm sorry, an incorporeal being. Mm -hmm. But uh, but a, a spirit in the normal sense of the word, when we're not talking about the, a human spirit, it, it's a being who exists incorporeally right. by nature. Right. And I And my point is, I think we have one of those that makes part of us. Which well, makes us special. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing like here's which is why demons are mad. Yep. Well, we've talked about we've talked about so to take this back to Nephilim, right? And just to restate for anybody that's never heard us talk about this, in Genesis, the the conversation is that angels essentially fell from God's grace and took human women as wives and had children. They had offspring, and these offspring were essentially unholy um, because they were a, an inappropriate an undesired um, outcome of, of two things happening. And they're that when, unclean because they're, they are a mixing of two categories that aren't supposed to mix. And, and when these Nephilim died, their spirits had nowhere to go because they're not part of heaven. They're not part of this plane of existence, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what a demon is. So I find it odd that it's easy to talk about demons coming out of the dead Nephilim but not to think that humans would have a, a, an, op an opposing incorporeal well, state of existence. I, I have two answers to that. Um, one, I mean, the, the book of Enoch explicitly teaches that the Nephilim are like the, un, the, the demons, what are called unclean spirits in, in the gospels, they are the way they are. Like they are, they're disembodied spirits roaming around looking for embodiment. That's why they possess people, mm -hmm. but they survive the death of the body, the death of their human body. Cause they're, they're, they're partly human. Um, the physical aspect of them is their humanity. When that dies, they still have the, the watcher part this, the angel part of them that is alive. Um, the reason that they they're roaming around disembodied looking looking for bodies to inhabit it is because they are half of their nature is is indigenous to heaven mm -hmm. they're like they they are by nature immortal spirits mm -hmm. humans are not the same humans die and when we die our spirits are dead the suggestion is from the book of enoch like the the nephilim are only demons only roam around as spirits that survive the death of the bodies because they're hybrids because they're not fully human it's that it's that mm. the, the, i, I the think part. i think there's i think there's more to it than that but before but one well that i'm just telling you what the book of enoch says i, I understand but the it's more than just because they're hybrids it's because there was not a part of god's in his system that was created for them right so I, 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 well, I, that's, that's why they are, you know, th that's why, that's why God is, you know, wrathful against the watchers for, for creating them. But that's not, that's not the explanation for why they are, 
disembodied spirits that survive that that survive their their bodily death and so look for new bodies. No, so the, let me let me finish my 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 sentence because I I don't it's not I think you're it's interesting that you said that the angels created them. I think the reality is that it was the humans that created them. So the reason that humans are God's image bearer and not the angels and the difference between humans and angels is that humans can create spirits. Our reproduction creates spirits by definition. Angels don't have the ability to create themselves again. They can't how reproduce. Do, how, do, how do you know that? I don't know this. I'm, 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 I'm suggesting a theory. So the reason that the Nephilim were different is a combination of two things. One, they're a hybrid, they're of two different natures, but they clearly were able to copulate and reproduce. So there has to be a certain level of similarity there. But the humans, because of the gifts that God gave us, were able to, to, to continue to recreate. And that's what, so the Nephilim spirits that were created were created outside of the designed system, which is why they, they wander. All of our spirits are designed to go somewhere. And, 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 if, and if we don't believe in the concept of, of an incorporeal spirit, if that's off the table, theologically, then that makes hell off the table. Why? Because, well, there's, why would you have a body recreated just to be put into a place of torment? That's what the Bible says. No, it doesn't. Absolutely does. No. I'm going to read it to you. Sure. No, not, not tonight. And make this I mean, a, make this, <laughs> oh, that's, that's fair. That's fair. We, we, we already it's, talked about doing another episode it, on. It's, yeah, it's on, really we're, short. We're going to, we're going to do end times. Yeah. And, end times. If it's an end and, times, you're right. It's a good teaser. Like, yeah. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some do really? everlasting life. Really others not. to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead men into righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. And there's a, there's another verse in John where Jesus Brian, what part of we're going to do this later? Like, like, let it go. It's well, a teaser. It's a teaser. Well, there's, there's more to that. We can keep going, but I mean, next week when we talk about that, right. but, okay. but I mean, you, you said that now and you said, no, it's not in the Bible. It is and, in the Bible. and you said it is so fine. So we could talk about right. it next week. Right. Every discussion has had to be resolved in real time. Um, so Pe um, people need to have a reason to tune back in, but about, you know, about spirits, um, well, okay. In First Corinthians fifteen, Paul talks about how the uh, about the spiritual body versus the physical body. A lot of people read that with the assumption of the whole going to heaven thing, um, but he is explicitly talking about the resurrected body. Of course, people we 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 kind of bring this Gnostic dualism to the to the passage though, and assume that there's a there's this strict distinction between spirit and body. He is talking about the a physical bodily resurrection, but he calls it a spiritual body. Calling it a spiritual body doesn't mean it's not physical. Um, we have spirits now. Would you would would you agree? Like we actually are spirits now. We're we're okay. consciousnesses embodied and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty clear on it because I, I said that was my, that's, that's, that, that was, was my statement. position. Yeah, that, that right. was the position. Yeah, I just, I'm starting with what we agree with before I, to, to build on that. But um, let, me, let, let me, let me clarify something real quick before you go down this path, because you're, you're, you're doing something that you've done before when we've had these kinds of conversations where you're arguing a point that I'm not making and you're creating a disagreement that we're not having. So I you're, wasn't you're, even saying. I wasn't even Hang saying on. that to argue. Let me, let me finish my thought. You're jumping ahead to defend the disembodied spirits don't go to heaven discussion. And whether or not we have a spirit that's, that's able to be disembodied doesn't mean that it goes to heaven. One can be true without the other. This isn't a one plus one equals two kind of conversation. So okay. like you're, you're jumping ahead talking about Paul's not talking about going to heaven. I'm not talking about going to heaven. I'm simply saying that I think we do have an, incorpor an incorporeal spirit that's okay. a part of who we are as our consciousness. Sure. And, and I wasn't saying any of this necessarily to argue with you. 
Um, I am saying with the awareness that people, not you, but people listening um, or people, people who people listening might have heard from often read 1 Corinthians 15 to interpret it that way. I'm just addressing that. It's not, it's not okay. directed at you. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, spiritual body versus the, the physical body. The people reading that have this, have this assumption of Gnostic dualism, that if it's a spiritual body, it's non-physical. Um, but in our physical body, we have spirits. We are spirits. Um, just as in our physical body, we have spirits. Likewise, in the spiritual body, we have physicality. Like the two, the two things are not mutually exclusive. That we that we think the they that we think they are. It's more of that Gnostic dualism I'm, I'm always talking about. In the spiritual body, it's the spirit that is the dominant aspect. Just as now, this the 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 physicality of our bodies is the is the dominant aspect. With the spiritual body, we're not bound by our physical limitations. We're kind of set free by the spirit. I think that we're I think we'll be extra dimensional beings. I think that we'll be able to just as Jesus could appear and disappear in a locked room without traverse. I, I think it was kind of like it's kind of like three dimensional beings interacting in flatland. Like you don't have to traverse from directly from point A to point B and the, on the two dimensional plane, you can leave it and go into three dimensions and come back down into two. I think that's what he was doing. And I think when Paul talked about how Jesus ascended um, higher and higher to fill the entire heavens, I think likewise, we're not going to be bound by the, the physical constraints that we are now. We'll have physical bodies but we won't be bound by them. We can, I, we can, we'll, we'll be able to do things I can only imagine, but it'll, uh, but yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's what it means by spiritual bodies. Um, Nephilim on the other hand are, they're kind of the inverse of the spiritual body that, that Paul was talking about. They're, they're immortal spirits trapped in physical bodies it's kind of a perversion of the resurrection body it's a it's an inverse of it so anyway i just thought that how, was how, how do how do we know that people that talk about going to heaven aren't actually describing exactly what you just said they just don't articulate it in that in that way and, and we just assume for lack of for lack of articulation that we just mean a disembodied spirit going to the sky daddy in the clouds because because you did a lot of explaining that's not written like how how do how do we know that when when i if i were to just say hey i think i'm going to heaven that that's not exactly what i mean because the resurrection of the dead is something that happens here on earth at a at a at a point in history that is okay Okay. That was easy. Wow. No, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure I buy it, but I don't know that I do either. Okay. I don't have a I don't have a rebuttal, but I don't have a rebuttal. That's why I said I do. I actually do. Um it's so we talk about God being able to live outside of space and time, right? In whatever dimension or realm. Yeah. Right. So so like using as an example, a person having an, an NDE, a near death experience, and then they, they come back to life and they're like, Hey, I was in heaven. And everybody's like, Oh, really? What was it like? And there's like, Oh, these people were here and things. It and was stuff. exact. It was exactly as your cultural condition you to expect. Or, or they actually had an experience in the future after the identic rebirth of heaven and earth. And God gave them a glimpse of what the end times actually looks like, but because they didn't understand what they were looking at and didn't have a reference point, the only thing they could re they could use to recommunicate what they experienced was this ephemeral, which is which is woefully lacking. Right, because words don't words can't experience. words can't explain what they saw, 
Basically, so, they learned what magnetic north was, and they don't know how to tell you. <laughs> they, they, was, I could see with my tongue. It was I mean, fantastic. Th- right? I mean, I, you know, what if? Sure. But sure. Is there, I mean, that's. Is, is there? Is I mean, there that's, any, that's no. That's no more there, out of the box than what you just described five minutes ago about the well, is there fourth any, dimensional is, stuff. Well, is there any? Well, but my what I described is based on what the scripture is. My question to Matt is what is. <laughs> Well, hold nothing on. that, that you described script. is based on well, the scripture. Nothing the scripture talks about four dimensions. And, well, no, and, I base that on Jesus' resurrection appearances. He he appeared in a in a locked room. He he didn't he didn't go through the door. He didn't climb in through a window. He just appeared suddenly out of nowhere. But but you're but you're just I don't, leaving it with whatever science we can think of, and not what. How, know, how do you know he wasn't God. teleported down by Scotty? How do I know there wasn't a starship in orbit? That I, I'm, I'm, in? I'm saying like for a person to appear into a locked room, you're you're saying that there's only one way that that, that would have happened. And it was this four dimensional travel. And well, I'm like, he could I, have been he I, could have been, you know, particleized by a freaking alien technology. Well, I mean, if if, if anything is on the table, sure, maybe it was a starship. <laughs> but there 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 are good reasons to to suspect that there are higher spatial dimensions. That's not me just making stuff up. That's I, I, that's I agree with discussion. you, but just so because someone that, can't articulate that in, in like the way you did with your mind doesn't mean that that's not what going to heaven means. Well, what people, what people typically mean when they talk about going to heaven, it's they it, it's they go as a disembodied spirit into an afterlife and they leave this world. And the reason I have such a problem with that, we're going to get into next week when we talk about eschatology. But the I, I don't think there's any particular reason to believe they're doing that. Brian, it, it, in my circles, okay, people don't believe that. People don't believe what? Well, that they go to heaven as a disembodied spirit. Well, but your but your circles are. I mean, you you were raised well, Jehovah's Witnesses, cultish, right? So Mormons don't believe that. Most Christians believe that. Well, I, I think I think most Christians can articulate it properly. I think what I think what they believe is what you just said, ten minutes ago. I, I, I don't I don't think that's true. I don't think that's. I think most of them think that it's about escaping this world. And that and that 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 paradigm of what Christianity is costs them understanding what what the actual paradigm is and what the church should actually be doing. That's 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 a different thing, though. In fairness, you, you, a different you, thing than what than the way they. So if if we were to hang on, in, in if. Because I'm going back to the near-death experience, because I think that's the closest we would have to a modern-day version of a vision. Just we don't sure. have we don't have prophets that we're aware of that I'm aware of. The LDS Church has prophets. Oh, okay. <laughs> Christianity doesn't have prophets that I'm aware of. Um, but if a person was to have a near-death experience and they were to report it. While I agree with you, Brian, that their interpretation of what they saw could be misrepresented as a, a, a wrong think of the end times, that doesn't mean what they experienced wasn't real and wasn't correct. It just means they don't know how to communicate what they saw, and they're and they're falling into a bad example of maybe, maybe the very first version of this again, what if like I'm, I'm hundred percent spitballing some dude, some chick, whatever, some person actually died. God actually gave them a vision of what the end times are going to look like. And it was them. And I'll use your hundred, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with your theory or your, 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 exec, your, 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 representation of what you believe it is and they were in a a spiritual body in a in in a spiritual in a divine reborn earth and heaven and they were experiencing things on a plane that they didn't understand because they didn't get the whole step process of how they got there and when they came back to 
and they were suddenly brought back to life. And the intention was God wanted them to tell them about the visions they saw. And they were like, what, where, where, what happened? They were like, I don't know. I was floating. They're like, wait, you were floating. You were in heaven. And they were like, I guess. MAGA hats. <laughs> right. But they weren't. They were just, right. they were moving through space time on the fourth dimension because it, that's what we can do in our, there, in our, in our spiritual bodies. Is there any particular reason to believe any of that? Is there a reason not to? Yeah, it's, it's you, cause you're just making it up. I mean, it's, it's totally ad hoc. But that's a, that's an assertion. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's, it's a possibility that a person had a vision that they miss that they weren't able to articulate clearly. And it took on a life of its own. The telephone game well, turned sure. it into a, any, turned, turned it into a theology. Anything's possible, but the, the, the simplest explanation tends to be the correct one. And, 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 you know, in absence of, so you're going to apply Additional Occam's language. razor to to the prophecies in the Bible that yeah. you're just going to assume that they didn't actually happen and they were people experiencing like no I, things I don't that they didn't I, know how to articulate properly. I, I don't assume that. Why why would I assume that about prophecies of the Bible? I, I don't know. Like like well like, like how how are, how are you how are you smuggling that in? To the same smuggling category. that sounds very nefarious i like the i like i like the assertion of intent that's what that's what you did i mean you're like it, it unless like what what is the commonality between ndes and prophecies in the bible if if an okay. nd if an nde exists if right I, I don't know i've never had one well if, I, I if mean you ask me a question i'm trying to answer it if ndes actually occur and humans have technically died or been mostly dead and had a vision of something beyond their plane of existence. So it's a, this is a big if, but I'm with you. I, I'm yeah, if, along. if it were to happen, the only explanation would be is that they were having a spiritual experience. Okay. But the, the problem with that, that your if is we don't know, and there's no way to know if, that's what actually happened or if they're having some kind of a deep dream sequence that was all of their thoughts just recompiling inside their head right how do how do we I agree know with that. john of how do we know john of patmos had his vision and that it's true you know we can get into that but i think that's kind of that's kind of a different subject and like you're kind of okay. If you like think it, so, it, okay. it seems like you guys are committed to. I I don't even know what point you guys are arguing, but it seems like you're committed to kind of conflating stuff like NDEs, which don't require a supernatural explanation, and just kind of throwing all of Scripture in the same category as that. And I don't I don't know where you're coming from or what or what your what your point is to doing that. I, I would I would counter that. I don't understand why you're so aggressively refuting theoretical conversation about what it could or couldn't be. If you, if we want to get to the bottom of it, I think that we should go with what's with what data we have. And I mean, I, I think what you're offering is wildly speculative. Can I disprove it? No, I can't prove that's not that, that they're not really having a supernatural vision, but I don't have any particular reason to believe that they are having a supernatural vision that they really did die and leave their body and go some other place. I think you have to be committed to that as an idea in order to take that idea, in order to take that explanation seriously. The, the simpler explanation is that they just, they had a, they had a, all of this was an experience within their own brain, either on, on either side of death before, as their brain was dying or right after they were re resuscitated, but there's no particular reason to believe that their consciousness was somewhere else in the time in between. I mean, you can we can speculate all day long about what was really happening. Maybe how do you know aliens weren't beaming the experience directly into their brain to fool humanity? Sure. Can you prove that didn't happen? Sure. Well, but and we have about as much reason to believe that that was happening as we do for the scenario that you propose. So. Like I don't, I don't know what value there is in, in exploring these things. I mean, if there's, if there's no particular reason to believe that. And so, like, if, 
you know, and to your question, Dre, how do you, how do you know John of Patmos didn't do that? I mean, I can, I'm happy to go into the, my, it, 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 okay. it it's going to be a much longer show, but it's uh, kind okay. of a non sequitur. Uh, okay. Okay. So I, I don't know what, what, where are we at? What's, what's the, what, where are we, uh, what's the conclusion here? Conclusion is we have no idea what causes consciousness and there's no way to prove or disprove any of those theories. So there's no way to tie consciousness to anything that resembles the afterlife. It's kind of where we are. But um, if you listening <laughs> think, think that there is, or if we miss something, or uh, if there's an angle that, that we didn't get to, we, we had lots of angles and lots of different things. Hey, let us know uh send send, a, send an email send a send a carrier pigeon send some morse code we learned that once upon a time smoke um, screens yeah. smoke signals uh yeah get in touch with us because you know got a little combative there at the end but whatever fun it's okay i won in the end <laughs> he, he's, he's clearly having an nde <laughs> that's what he's having right now He's, he's he's having an ND, or maybe you think Brian won, and then if in that case you're canceled, you can't listen to our show ever again. And, uh, <laughs> Daily cancellations are coming. So, you have my um, permission to keep listening. That, that's going to be a new poll we need to start. Who won, A, B, C, or D? Yeah, boom. Uh, so with that, unless unless my colleagues here have something else to add, I will say oh, I'm uh, good. Stay, <laughs> stay curious. And uh, stay. What else we stay? Conscious. Uh, uh, conscious. Stay conscious. I think. I think enlightened is the thing, enlightened. But yeah. I think that. I think we're assuming Con a lot when we say that. But. Con consciously enlightened. Stay consciously enlightened, and we will see you next week when we're talking about end times. God bless. <laughs>